You've probably been wondering where the heck I've been for the last month. Allow me to explain. Let's back up four or five years. My wife and I started reading to our daughter at a very young age. Ah, hold on. I just want the record to show that out of the two of us, I am much better than my wife at doing character voices. Only one family member was missing from the ceremony. Mufasa's brother, Scar. Well, I was first in line until the little hairball was born. Said Scar. That hairball is my son and your future king. Mufasa replied. Anyway. We have always read a lot with our kids, and one book that we used to read quite often with our daughter is Town Mouse, Country Mouse. It's an adapted Aesop fable about a city mouse who longs for the simple, quiet country life, and a country mouse desires the convenient lifestyle of the city. The two mice swap places before realizing they had it pretty good where they were to begin with. To help her relate to the book, I would tell her that Daddy grew up in a small town, so I was a crunchy mouse. That's how she'd pronounce it. Well, Mommy was a high-maintenance materialistic town mouse. Hey! All joking aside, it was at that time that I began to realize that I really am a crunchy mouse at heart. And over the course of the last few years, my desire to live in a smaller community has just grown. Which brings us to a few weeks ago when my wife and I stumbled across this beautiful house in this quiet suburban neighborhood with plenty of family very close by. So even though this is the worst possible time to move, we conditionally bought that house. Because although things have been incredibly busy and quite difficult for us in the short term, this is the best thing for our family in the long term. All right, let's get caught up on some Oilers talk. I just want to be clear about something before I begin. There have been a lot of people revising their opinions on players since they've been traded. <coughs> Flames, Lucic. <coughs> Luchich. But I'm going to try to remain consistent with my opinion of every player the Oilers have acquired. Let's rewind all the way back to the Andre Sekera buyout. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before, but the only time in the last four years that the Oilers' defense was somewhat healthy, they had a 103-point season, and Sekera was a big reason for this. During his time in Edmonton, the team played at an 84.6 point pace with him in the lineup. A yearly point total like this puts you in the playoff conversation every season. I believe the Oilers could have squeezed some more value out of him in the final two years of his deal. I don't mind Holland making some room for a promising young defenseman to have a spot, but I would have much preferred the Oilers buy out Chris. If I'm not blocking shots, I'm rimming it around the boards, Russell. If Holland doesn't use the additional cap space from this buyout to acquire a top six winger, I won't be happy about this move. All right, next we have, oh yeah, Mike Smith. Yes, I did want to play in the NHL my whole life. And, you know, I thought if I ever was able to, you know, pay the registration to get into real minor hockey, I think I might have got, you know, I believe I might have went to the show. Not that Mike Smith. But, quite honestly, I think I would have preferred that one. When the Flames acquired this guy, I laughed. And the reason that I laughed is because he was so obviously not the answer. They missed the playoffs his first year there, and they won one playoff game his second year there. The thing about Mike Smith is, he's a really bad goaltender, but he's also old and injury prone. No, should have used a different conjunction there. Let me try that again. The thing about Mike Smith is, he sucks and he's elderly and fragile. Another thing I don't like about old man Smith is that he plays the puck. This isn't exclusive to Smith. I can't stand when goaltenders play the puck. I think if they come out of the crease, they should be fair game. Allowing them to come out just grinds any forecheck to a halt. It is, however, not all bad when it comes to father time. Holland only signed Smith to a one-year contract, so 
it's entirely possible that he only plays 25 to 30 games in an Oilers uniform. Also, he signed him to an incentive-based contract. So the better he plays, the more he gets paid. I don't know why more GMs don't do this because it puts all of the onus on the player to perform. Now, with the departure of zero goal scorer Toby Reeder, Toby must be moving on. The Oilers also signed a few depth players in free agency. They added another former flame in Marcus Granlund, as well as two former 2011 draft picks in Thomas Yurko and Josh Archibald. I love this. I know a lot of people probably don't because they want to see the Oilers drastically improve the roster and make the playoffs next year. But, correct conjunction this time, thank you, I feel this upcoming season must be a transitional year. The Oilers simply can't go out and make a bunch of trades and free agent signings to fix everything. Because last year, Peter Shirelli did a lot of extra damage to the roster and cap situation. What I want to see Edmonton do, and what I think Holland is actually attempting to do, is fill out the roster this season with stopgap players. This accomplishes two things. It allows for a second consecutive year of solid development on the farm team before bringing those guys up, and the Oilers will have a lot more cap space in the summer of 2020. Between Gagne, Cassian, Granlund, Brodziak, Archibald, Nygaard, Yurko, Manning, and Smith, the Oilers will have $14.475 million coming off the books, and mainly from roster spots that can be filled by players on entry-level deals. I understand that it is really important that the Oilers get back into the playoffs next year. But the roster simply isn't positioned well for a quick fix. There are just too many bad contracts for the team to get out from under before they can start signing guys who are actually worth those kinds of salaries. Which brings me to the trade. I'm going to spend some time talking about Lucic first. If you follow me, you know that I've always been a big fan of Milan. My video about him signing with the Oilers is one of the most popular videos I've ever done. And I agree with everything I said in that video about Lucic bringing much needed size and physicality to the Oilers lineup. Milan is one of the best fighters in the league. He's one of the hardest hitters. And he's basically impossible to move from the front of the net. The problem is, there's no place for Lucic in the game anymore. Just like I don't belong in the city, Lucic doesn't belong in the NHL. First of all, no one will fight him. This is partially because no one wants to. He'd beat the living tar out of 90% of the guys in the league. But the other reason is, no one has to anymore. Fighting is being pushed out of the game, which I don't agree with. But the threat of intimidation no longer exists because players know they don't need to be held accountable to their opponent. Case in point, I was at the game last November where Matthew Kuchuk was going after Connor McDavid. Naturally, Zach Cassian lined up against him in the faceoff to tune him in. Kuchuk did his best impression of Brenda Clark's Franklin, and Cassian was issued 18 minutes in penalties. McClellan was then forced to put Lucic on McDavid's wing to act as a deterrent. It wound up losing the Oilers the game. I came home from that game with an epiphany about the NHL. Rats run the league now. Players like Marchand, Kadri, and Kachuk can just run amok because they know the worst case scenario is that 50% of the time the ref will flag them with a two minute minor. But the other half of the time, you have plays like this egregious hit from behind by Matthew Joseph go uncalled, and then Lucic winds up with 14 minutes in penalties and a $10,000 fine. I've heard a lot of spin out of Calgary about how having Lucic in the lineup will prevent guys from slashing Johnny Hockey. Good luck with that. Lucic's presence in the Flames lineup is also not going to force Goudreau to quit acting like a soccer diva and play through the physicality of the playoffs. But I digress. This is an Oilers blog. Secondly, Lucic's body checking 
is as ineffective as it's ever been because players league-wide are more reluctant than ever to throw big body checks. Since so many hits are reviewed by the Department of Player Safety, you don't want to risk a suspension or fine by accidentally clipping a guy in the chin throwing a big check. And finally, there's a reason that a segment of Oilers fans have nicknamed Lucic Lurch instead of Luch. It's because around Christmas of 2017, Lucic's already limited ability to handle the puck, combined with a league-wide focus on skill on lines one through four, has made Milan look like a semi-truck being driven by someone who doesn't know how to use a clutch. Truth be told, it has been embarrassing watching him for the last year and a half. I mean that. It's been hard to watch. I feel bad for the guy because he's like a fish out of water at this point. Paying him $6 million to be a fringe fourth line player was crippling the Oilers until Calgary came along and decided to show the entire hockey world just how dead the Battle of Alberta is by relieving the Oilers of one of the five worst contracts in the league. But hey, when you have a chance to replace Garnet Hathaway and his $850,000 salary with an older, slower player making $5.25 million, you got to do it. I've heard a lot of Flames fans trying to justify this move by saying, well, essentially we're trading our trash for your trash. One undeniable difference, at the very least, is that the Oilers can take their trash to the dump, and the Flames can't. Don't get me wrong, I'm not calling Lucic or Neil trash. What I'm saying is both have bad contracts, but the Oilers have the luxury now of being able to buy their way out of the deal. Now, as for James Neal, remember earlier when I was talking about rats? Yeah, he's one of those guys. He's a sneakily dirty hockey player. As a matter of fact, someone put together a compilation of all of his dirty hits and put it on YouTube. There's a link to that below in the description. But what that means is he's the type of guy who can thrive in the league today. I really want to differentiate between Lucic and Neal and why the Oilers won this deal by such a wide margin. First of all, much has been made about Neal's drop-off in production. But his decline isn't even in the same ballpark as Lucic. Neal had seven goals in 63 games last year. Lucic has seven goals in his last 125 games. That's almost exactly double the amount. Secondly, many people are trying to compare Neal and Lucic's ability to keep up with the play. Well, I can tell you this. Lucic is in fantastic shape every season and he's had two straight long summers to train. He is as fast as he's going to get. I've read several accounts on Neil that indicate that he wasn't fully physically recovered from back-to-back -back trips to the Stanley Cup final and that had a lot to do with his lack of quickness last year. And the third thing separating these players is while Lucic's game has become irrelevant in the league today, Neil has something that will never go out of style in hockey. He can shoot. He may have been useless to Calgary, but he can help Edmonton in a big way here. Edmonton has brutal wing depth, so Neil will probably play all year with one of Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, or Ryan Nugent Hopkins. I feel better about the Oilers today than I did a month ago, which is a good sign. Although, I'd still like to see Holland add another top six winger, preferably someone like Jason Zucker from Minnesota. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the other summer so far. I know there's been a lot of ground to cover since my last video, so feel free to leave a long-winded response in the comments, and I will try to respond in a timely manner. I'll see you next time.